Awesome. We should, we should see my ugly mug. Yeah, we can. Thanks for that. No worries. <laughs> Over to you. You should see a slide with my ugly mug on it as well. We can. Awesome. Hey, guys. Thanks for joining. Um, I'm Andy Parsons. Uh, just a bit about me. Um, cloud architect based in Melbourne, Australia. And uh, my experience has been in various system engineer and DevOps roles for probably the last 20 years. Um, most recent experience prior to joining Pure was a data center architect at Facebook and IT, um, managing just about everything under the sun from scales of four to 40,000 nodes. Uh, my primary focus now is uh, cloud architecture, data management, containerization, automation. Um, and I'm in charge of Portworks in the region, which I think is probably one of the most exciting technologies we have in our portfolio. Um, and it brings together Two of my favorite things, uh, Kubernetes and data management. Um, so today we're going to talk about persistent storage and Kubernetes. Um, but before we get into that, just want to mention a few possible guest speakers who may or may not make an appearance today. Uh, the first will be my pup, Shadow, who's a six-month-old Aussie who discovered that he can bark to get mom and dad's attention. Um, and my two daughters, Ison and Sky, who are known to sing Frozen and run around the house with Barbie. So uh, look out for those potential uh, speakers. So let's get into it. Um, guys, I'm going to break this session down into three things. Uh, first, we'll talk about you know, why people are using persistent storage. More specifically, you know, why they use appliance-based CSI, why they use software-defined storage-based, and then lastly, the cloud. What are some of the issues that arise in these areas? And then lastly, how people are doing it and how uh, roles companies like Pure can play. Um, so who's doing this? Well, what's compelling them to do this? These are sort of the questions that we often ask ourselves. You know, as container adoption grows, more people are looking for ways to move their stateful apps to Kubernetes. And we often find two key people are the ones that make this decision. Well, it's, which is often very political, depending on your organization or maybe the size of your organization. Now, more often than not, it's a developer who builds these applications. You know, they've they've built a Java app or a custom application that runs in Linux, probably on a virtual machine, seemingly forever. Now, and then as they experiment with containers, they realize, crap, we can build, test, and deploy this a lot faster packaged as a container. You know, we can also do it anywhere, right? It doesn't matter if it's on-prem or in the cloud, as long as there's a runtime. And this means less time developing the app and more time enhancing it, stabilizing it, securing it, adding features, things like that. Now, additionally, we see DevOps teams and SRE teams tasked with keeping these applications running. You know, once it's in production, if a developer makes a change to say, crash a billing system, dev and SRE are usually ones tasked with fixing it. And we often speak to teams you know, whose developers have many instances running on different systems. They may have five different business units, all with their own development teams. But somebody's got to keep the lights on. Somebody's got to keep it up and running. You know, and as organizations realize the value of you know, an integrated CI CD workflow, being able to use a common framework for all of these application deployments starts to make a lot of sense. So it's inevitable that people will want to put persistent storage workloads into the space eventually. And we see people putting everything from analytics to databases, AI and machine learning type workloads, all of which want to either read from or write to a data set. You know, so often these data sets sit on a storage platform managed by IT. You know, and developers are typically customers of that service. You know, so you generally uh, leverage what's available to you. And this is how most people become familiar with CSI. I actually had a meeting today with a customer who uses VMware Cloud Volumes CSI driver in their OpenShift environment. Uh, for persistent storage on uh, Prometheus, monitoring all sorts of their virtual infrastructure. Now, this capability allows you know them to method a method to you know programmatically access storage for the application. Typically, these requests are via manifest or an API. 
So they don't generally care about the underlying storage. Remember with Kubernetes, we're all about abstraction of infrastructure. We just want a storage class that we can assign to our app so that we can read and write some data. Now, persistent storage, it's an evolving effort. It's constantly being approved on. And with that, there's a growing trend to consider moving stateful app workloads to Kubernetes. Now, often the hardest workloads are the last to be moved or deployed. And as you always, you might imagine, those are usually uh, stateful workloads. Now, you've probably heard a lot of names in the space. Kubernetes wasn't designed for stateful. Storage is not ready. Some of them have no reason other than that's the way they've always done it. Or it may just be scared of running production databases in a containerized environment. And some may say it's not ready because the vendor they deal with does not yet have a production offering. Now, as we move workloads into this space, we look at how to run that app in production, just like anything else. So things like disaster recovery, backup, and high availability become factors. Hey, Andy. Hey. Yep. Andy, it's Paul here. Yep. Um, do you think it's worthwhile? Let's have a chat to the audience and ask them. We'll just run a poll and see how many of them have stateful uh, state yeah, boats out there. Yeah, do it. I just lost my train of thought. You am, I, am, I, am I waiting for the poll to run or can I continue? No, no it's running. It's running? Okay. Oh, we've got lots of people answering too, so okay. yeah. I'll just pop those results back up on the... On beautiful, the beautiful. I might just grab a water. So things like disaster recovery, backup, high availability, those become factors, right? And you'll find there's a myriad of CSI options available today that can address these problems. Excuse me. You know, some array vendors are more sophisticated than others. And if you look at the CSI spec, uh, you can see that we have features like create and delete, resize, snapshot, import, things like that available. And this allows some level of data protection. But often, due to shortcomings of CSI, we're forced to use features that are not native to Kubernetes, like being able to replicate a volume to another Kubernetes cluster. You know, this is something you might rely on your array vendor to do, software to do. And while it can be done, it now makes your Kubernetes system dependent on something outside Kubernetes. And you've removed that visibility inside of Kubernetes as well. And this sort of goes against the grain of abstraction. And now we can do a lot with custom resource definitions, creating custom workflows as part of our pipeline. Um, and we can work around a lot of these issues. And we can always script the answer to a problem. The challenge is that's not native, and this causes problems down the road. Now, appliance-based CSI is often seen as is what you see on-prem due to the nature of how orgs traditionally consume infrastructure. Remember, I stated how a lot of teams become familiar with any particular CSI driver is often based on what storage strategy that org has chosen. Now let's say your application development team has decided that they want to have one common framework for application deployment, which is using containerization. And now you have a new version of that billing system, which you want to containerize. And perhaps that current environment runs on an expensive flash storage, providing throughput for that database on the back end. But you now have a need to move it to Kubernetes. You might consider using your storage array and that CSI driver for that. Some of our customers using Pure Storage, uh, Pure Service Orchestrator, which uses our CSI driver among along with multiple workloads. And we've seen customers um, use our flash blade, which offers high concurrent parallel throughput for file workloads, combining things like Jupyter Notebook as a service, or Jupyter as a service, excuse me, data analytics, and rewrite many type workloads in communities all on a single platform. Some people choose to run their Oracle or SQL alongside VMware or OpenStack, 
in addition to virtualized OpenShift or Kubernetes on our flash array. Now, Pure CSI differentiates in its ability to aggregate block and file storage requests from any of its fleet of products from a single CSI installation. And Pure takes a community approach to, the, to CSI development. Engineering and development teams are active in the community, contributing to both improving the spec, uh, along with updating the CSI driver to the latest feature. Hey, Andy, it's Paul again. Yeah, I was going to say, I might pause for any <laughs> questions or if anybody would care to share their uh, experiences with CSI and array and uh, array based technologies. Well, Bala has actually asked two questions um, in the in the Q and A, um, both of which are quite interesting. He asked, "What are the best practices to back up persistent volumes?" And he's asking about if there are any tools to encrypt data of persistent volumes uh, at rest and uh, in transit. Great questions. Uh, I might answer the second one first. So, um, when it when it comes to CSI. That's not a uh, encryption is not a feature that is a uh, is part of the CSI spec. So generally, that's something you would rely on that array vendor um, to offer. So encryption at rest and encrypted volumes. Um, now, when you get into some of the software defined tools, like like Portworks offers encryption um, encryption at rest and data in flight, um, and even per volume encryption. So you can be very granular with that, and it supports um, HashiCorp and um, AWS and all the common um, encryption mechanisms. Um, and what was the first question? I was trying to, I work in backwards there. I know. What are the best practices to back up persistent volumes? And I guess, uh, you know, that, that leads you into a, you know, question about uh, what level are we doing that at? Yeah, that's probably a philosophical question. Um, I think it depends on, on on a use case and what you're trying to do. Um, you know, certainly with an array-based platform, you might leverage the CSI snapshotter um, custom resource definition to be able to use to leverage snapshots, um, and those would be snapshots on your array, right? So that storage array pr is providing snapshots, and then you can then use those in, you know, if you need to do restorations and things like that. Um, I think everyone sort of answers that probably a bit differently um you'd probably look at that and go what what is the what is the use case right because if on the other end if you were needing something like being able to actually recover the whole application you need more than just a snapshot right you need to be able to recover you know config maps and secrets and um the state of that application as well um and if you were to move it to a new app a new cluster you need to be have a way to move that all that data and then rehydrate it. So I would say probably depends based on the environment. I, I think that um, our Portwork PX backup tool is quite exciting with its ability to actually back up a whole namespace into an S3 bucket. It is exciting. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the session. Were there any other questions before I move on? I'll take that as a that take silence no. as a no. You're you're obviously giving far too much uh, information. People know everything at this point. <laughs> well, okay, if anybody's got um, any questions, please put them into the questions little section there. Uh, you must, I mean, many of you will have already tried to set up, you know, Kubernetes and then try to attach some storage. Maybe you can share some of your experiences with that. If there's any bits that you found particularly hard, um, all all that sort of stuff would be really useful. Back to you, Andy. Th thanks for that. Sure, sure. Um, so let's shift a bit and um, have a look at software-defined storage. Now, if you look at storage from either appliance-based or software-based, uh, software-defined based, you know this could be hybrid cloud, maybe test dev on-prem and deploying to the cloud, or maybe a combination of all of the above, and you just don't want to rely on any sort of external platforms and would prefer it to be completely agnostic to infrastructure. And this idea tends to go hand in hand with the CI CD approach of having a standard common uh, framework. Um, and with software-defined storage, we can be less concerned about infrastructure 
and more focused on the business outcome. Now, there's a wide array of vendors in this space. Um, and the, the main drivers of solutions are um, using software defined, we find to be DevOps and SRE teams who manage the life cycles. Um, and we see less drive from infrastructure teams as they tend to, again, focus towards the appliance approach as it generally fits into the overall storage um, strategy of larger customers. You know, developers want something application granular with capable with things like disaster recovery, HA, and uh, backup. You know, they're often looking to address gaps that they find when they're running stateful workloads in production. Keyword being production. Now we run into issues with software defined in this space. You know, it's platform agnostic, which makes DevOps teams happy. They don't have dependence on where they run the workload, generally speaking. Um, and they're not reliant on IT, right? But we often find issues with complexity and scaling. And as these types of solutions aren't built for containers, so we've taken a legacy solution that provides general storage. We've added a CSI driver, but we still have complexity. And we might need to store a dedicated person just to manage it because, and it's not application aware. You know, so we when we look at things like now it's production, so now I need DR. You know, how am I going to recover this? Do I need to buy a DR solution? How will that solution integrate into my different environments, on-prem or in the cloud? You know, how will it handle cloud drives? Will it handle them the same way as local storage on, say, a virtual worker node? You know, how do I back up and restore applications? You know, I hear people saying, we don't need to back up with Kubernetes. And this is true in a stateless world, right? But if you suddenly get asked by a developer team to deploy a containerized payroll system that uses MongoDB, I think we can all agree that you know we want to back up that stateful data. You know, so does that solution support on-prem, the same as the cloud? And how do I keep it highly available? Now I might not want my applications to go down. I might want to be able to maintain that uptime, especially if it's a payroll system, right? You know, what happens when my commercial relationship changes between cloud vendors? What happens when a cloud vendor has an outage? You know, I may need to be able to get this up and running on another cloud as soon as possible. Now, we've actually put a lot of design and engineering into solving a lot of these problems. So you don't need to build custom scripts or workflows. Uh, we purpose built a data management platform Kubernetes for Kubernetes. Um, with real world customers, mission critical critical applications. Uh, this solves the common issues of data management, you know, on-prem or in the cloud. Portworks was built for containers to give you an application specific control plane, just centered around Kubernetes. And like Kubernetes, it's platform agnostic, which means it has no dependency on any particular infrastructure. So it looks at cloud drives, the same as it looks at local drives on your virtual worker node. And this makes it powerful in that it can provide storage that's application aware, either on-prem or in any public cloud with the same experience. And with features around security and disaster recovery and backups, you, know, you can build applications with these, as, these features as part of your deployment. So spend less time worrying about how your production application will be recovered, or restored or migrated to a new cluster. With Portworks, these are features you just turn on. So if you're providing critical applications to internal teams who need to worry about payroll processing or extending external customers need to always be able to check account balances, you know, Portworks provides these features missing from Kubernetes that complete what you need for an enterprise application. I'm going to pause right here because I probably have some questions about uh, to dig into. Andy, from the last poll, it looks like only about 20% of people don't have stateful applications and people seem to have stateful applications across the three, um, the three public clouds and on-prem. Do we want to run another poll just to find out um, whether they've got plans to put them into Kubernetes in future. Yeah, you run the poll and- uh, I'll do that. I'll sit here and either answer questions or uh, keep moving on. Oh, 
Okay. Sudden influx of votes. Now I can't I can't see any voting on my screen, so That's okay. I'll I'll tell you what's happening. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> That's quite interesting. It seems that AWS is the winner. There's eight people out there who, who think that they're going to be uh, deploying stateful workloads into Kubernetes. I don't know whether that's uh, into um, AKS or or whether that's a roll your own Kubernetes cluster, but it would be interesting if anybody wants to pop some other chat in or questions, that'd be great. I'll let you get on with that. But it looks like, yep, they're definitely on-prem, more in AWS and some in Azure and GCP. And there's only four people who... Uh, uh, say they've got no plans to put uh, those in uh, the workloads into Kubernetes. So we'll uh, we'll let you keep going with that now. Yeah, I would say this. Uh, you know, um, you know, my sort of finger in the wind, whatever you call it. Um, what I've seen in in at least in NZ and APJ over the last year uh, year to bit is um, a lot of stateless. Um, probably 90% stateless, um, and then you run into an org that's like got a huge stateful environment. But I would say a lot more. Probably people are sort of dabbling, putting their feet in the water, test dev, um, in probably NZ. Um, in Asia, I probably see it's 50 50 where we've got lots of workloads that are stateful. Um, so just sort of it's just sort of varies. I, I, the one thing I would say is it's growing the, the, the number of people that are going from no stateful to stateful is not shrinking, it's growing. So I just I'd throw up this slide, um, just talk about Portworks. I don't know if it's relevant, but I'm gonna talk about it for a minute. And um, you could said in the chat that, that I'm, it's stupid and you don't want me to, but I'm still gonna do it. Um, you know, I sort of talked about Portworks, how you know it, it does all these things, metric DR and things like that. And I'll get into that probably a little bit later, but fundamentally, um, what we do with with uh, Portworks is, um, since it's a software defined storage, we use um, the worker node storage underneath to create virtual volumes or, or pools that we then can provision virtual volumes that we can attach to um, to pods inside Kubernetes. We use a key value database to track the metadata between them and the ch configuration changes between nodes. So that volume could be a cloud drive, like a EBS volume. It could be um, just an SSD on a on a node. It, it could be a fiber channel LUN on a bare metal node as well. It doesn't really matter as long as it's a you know raw unmapped volume. Um, we then take those volumes and then we aggregate that into pools. And it could be RAID zero, it could be RAID ten, depending on how many drives um, you have. Um, and then we will when we create that pool we will um, benchmark each individual drives and then we'll assign categories. So high, low, medium, as far as IO profiles. Um, and they'll do random and sequential IOPS and latency uh, measurements. So they get a good measurement of each volume. Um, and then when we do that, you can tier storage um, and can create storage policies and you can create um, storage classes to say, I want you know these storage classes um, for this IO profile and so on and so forth. Um, and then you know we can, create you know replicas so i could say i have a storage class that has replicas and maybe a storage class that doesn't have replicas because i don't care about it because it's test and dev so um very granular in in that base configuration and no further questions i'm going to move on to the next slide um we did actually get a further question sorry andy that i had, had my uh that's okay uh, David was asking about chances of application on uh, with uh, JBoss and Oracle database going to Kubernetes from uh, bare metal. Going to Kubernetes from bare metal. Yeah. So deploying, you know, a, oh oh, a JBoss and Oracle in a, in a Kubernetes environment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, database is uh, probably the most common use case that we tend to see um, for container storage. You'd be a read write once, uh, volume, um, either on Portworks or on Flash Array. Was, the, that, was there more? I was just going to say, I think that, that there's quite, quite a lot of the Oracle products, the higher end ones, including 
database are actually supported on uh, Docker, and there's also, you know, there's also IP out there to get them onto Kubernetes as well. Yeah. So sure. Oracle or, Oracle supported up to nine, nine, I think nineteen G. Um, they don't have a production ready Oracle container image um, any further, I think, than twelve G though. Um, but it is supported. Um, I, I, that's less common. I haven't seen a lot of people do Oracle. Uh, I would say generally more people are doing smaller lightweight databases like MySQL, Cockroach, or Mongo, where they're disaggregating applications. Um, so we haven't seen a, mad, a mass exodus into the space of really large data sets yet. I think that as people become more um, broadly acclimated with, you know, running, deploying, managing, securing, restoring, and recovering Kubernetes, I think you'll see that become a thing. Um, certainly, you know, from a volume perspective, you know, if we up here don't, tr we look at an Oracle volume, we don't look at any differently in um, Kubernetes than we would if it were attached to Oracle. It's still a, a volume that's presented from an array, whether it's attached to a bare metal node via fiber channel, or a virtual node via iSCSI or an NFS volume. And that, I pref... Sorry, um, that's why well, I, <laughs> I, I thought you'd finished. Um, I was just going to point out that uh, Ron Eakins, one of our um, brilliant minds at, at Peel Storage, has actually got some blog entries on how to deploy uh, Oracle 19C on Docker and Kubernetes. So I'll just pop that, uh, I'll pop that link into the chat as well. Yeah. Actually, I'll put it into the uh, reply. I, I, I wanted to preface, um, I mentioned spe uh, specifically um, fiber channel on bare metal and um, I on... And I'm back. Can you hear me? Hey, welcome. Oh, cool. I say my I was midstream and my headphones. Um, we just got it, and we're all on the edge of our seat waiting. For <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, oh, what happened to my screen here? But lottery numbers. You were just going to give them to us, or? Yeah, what I was going to say was I. Uh, so I explicitly mentioned uh, bare metal fiber channel and virtual iSCSI for a reason. So it's generally. Um, you know, some vendors will support fiber channel on virtual. It's definitely not recommended. Um, I think Peer is probably on the fence where if you, we won't recommend it, we will do our best effort to support it if you would deploy it. Now the caveat is with fiber channel um, in a bare metal environment, you treat a bare metal node as, as another node on a fiber channel architecture, right? So you would zone a server to a zone set and you would um, attach your target initiator to that zone applied to a zone set if you understand fiber channel storage. And in the virtual environment, which is what most people operate in, you would, uh, to do that, you need to turn on NPIV, which is virtualization in, fi in the fiber channel. You need to basically zone the virtual machines um, and it just gets really messy. So generally it's not recommended and that's why I caveat that. Probably a lot more information than a lot of you cared to know, but now you know it. So knowing knowing is power, I guess. Anyways, the 80% of you that are in the cloud probably just, try, just, uh, just forget I said that. So <laughs> let's move on. Um, so, you know, while we're using Kubernetes to deploy applications anywhere, you know, when we introduce data management anywhere, this becomes a challenge, right? And we're suddenly now relying on a platform for data management, and that changes depending on where it's deployed, right? Now, this is one of the many reasons that people choose to be stateless to avoid this problem. You know, you know most of you probably thought, you know, while you're building stateless apps, you know, we have revision control in Git, we deploy via Jenkins, our configurations are stored in an image repo, right? So you only have to worry about backing those things up. You have snapshots for your image repo, the code is stored in Git, life's good. Now it seems like from what we see in research from people like Gartner and IDC customer feedback, a growing number of companies are now extending that to stateful applications. You know, or 
you've been asked to introduce staple applications by your company, possibly against your better judgment. <laughs> now, once we start talking about production applications, there's requirements such as DR, backup, and recovery that become necessary. So if we start to peel back the onion of cloud a bit, we run into some hurdles when it comes to persistent storage. You want to run a stateful workload in the cloud? You might consider EBS for storage. You then find that failover does not work across availability zones. So your application may not be resilient. Um, and you'll have to create a work around or a script um, or an external process to resolve this issue. Now, if fragility could be a concern, when it comes to attach and detach operations, applications can hang. When your application hangs, Kubernetes needs to restart the pod. This could be problematic if, if it can't detach that volume and reattach that volume to another pod on, say, a new worker node. Now, this causes that stateful data to become unavailable. Now, we want cloud-native backup and DR capability for Kubernetes. Now, when operating more than one cloud, or even a private and public cloud, you know, it's ideal to have one standardized recovery process that works across all of them and then provides you a common data, data management platform. There's not really a common way of doing this with all of the cloud vendors, you know, which means you need to build your own custom workflow and process for each one of them. And then there's a need for a standard set of tools that manages these things. Now, ideally, you want to focus your team's time on improving the delivery of content and services to your customers so that they'll spend more or use more or buy more of your stuff. Now, a pretty common discussion that I have with platform and dev teams is how to restore or migrate a stateful application across clusters. Now, this is easy as with stateless, right? Jenkins, Git, drain a node, redeploy elsewhere. But with the state, this becomes much more challenging. You know, we decided to build our application as containerized because it gives us the portability we could run anywhere on prem or in the cloud. But as you move that, move to make that application stateful, there's a gap in Kubernetes. So we need to address that. You now with technologies that are gonna provide us with that same capability. Andy, do you just want to ask everybody to see if they've been planning to do any backups? We've got a poll ready. Yeah, I'd love to. Okay. That's a good time to do it. Literally. Should I pause here for a second? Let's do that because we've All got right. a few people answering. Seems like uh, of the people who've asked. So we've had eight people answer so far, and you know, we're over halfway. So. Okay, 11 people answering. Yep, it looks like people uh, are at least planning to back up Kubernetes stateful apps. Oh, oof, okay. We're uh, definitely two, two thirds to one third of, of planning to do that anyway. What sort of, um, Andy, sorry, Stephen, what, what sort of use cases might there be for not choosing to back up stateful applications? Is that just, you just choose not to back them up because you hate them? Or <laughs> why would you not want to back up the stuff? It's either well, adding value to the process or it's not. I, I think if you go back to, you know, when I was talking about landscape. So in Australia, you probably see more people um, are sort of in that test dev space where they're testing um, mm -hmm. production. They're not yet, they haven't yet rolled out to production, right? So I don't care about backup, it's test dev, right? If it goes away. Um, I had this really interesting conversation with a customer today where we're talking about Kubernetes and stateful apps. I'm like, oh, we don't really have a stateful workload. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, well, we do have um, Prometheus in our um, that that run monitors our entire environment and it runs in OpenShift. Oh, cool. Okay. Prometheus runs um, in OpenShift. Um, you have stateful app. That's a stateful application, right? Yeah, it runs on a database in the back end. Oh, okay. Where do you, where's that database? Oh, it's on a persistent volume in our cluster. Cool. What are you using to monitor all of the, um, uh, or what does that monitor? Oh, all of our systems, all of our sites, all of our servers, networks, switches, yep. routers, Oops. firewalls, applications. You get the you get the gist. How are you backing that up? Oh, we haven't thought about that yet. That's not a concern. Is this production? What what happens if it goes down? 
uh, we have a, what, what do they say? Uh, 99.95 uptime. So three, nine uptime, which is a couple minutes of downtime. <laughs> so I was kind of like, um, yeah, we might want to have a conversation. Like, let me show you how we can do this. Uh, give you some fault tolerance here or do some, do, do backups here. Um, I guess it's just that story is, um, they weren't actually thinking about it. And I don't think they were really thinking that this app was um, production because it's just monitoring. And you think, well, that's good. But if you lost monitoring, how 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 would that impact your business? Like, well, yeah, I, mean, I, was, I was thinking the same thing when we were having that discussion, because if they try and redeploy that whole Prometheus stack to a new cluster, if they had a terrible hardware problem, well, OK. That's not going to be within their 99.99, no, or is it 99.95 SLA? They miss that. They, they take a couple of hours downtime of monitoring and they get a production problem. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. I, I think it's, you know, um, I would, my, you know, my, my thought was begin with the end in mind, right? Um, I, there's there's definitely a stigma that you know we're not running stateful. No one wants to run stateful. I've I've run into customers that are like we we don't generally do stateful. Um, the growing trend in the market is that um, people are putting more things into Kubernetes, and by that very nature, are going to be tasked with it. So I would say it's not a question of if, but when you will be tasked with stateful stateful workloads. So you may not have that request that that today, but if you persist on building your container architecture, it's a natural progression that workloads that are stateful will want to be moved over, right? Because otherwise we're monitor we're managing a VMware environment, we're managing a Kubernetes environment, and it would make more sense to put all your I just say eggs in the basket, but that's a, a, you know, we all sort of buy into that adoption of this technology, right? So not sure if that answers your, what your question was, Stephen. I hope it did, but. No, I think it, I think it's really, really important to, to, to not, not overlook the importance of um, monitoring and the value that it can add to your environment, not only to your customers, but also if it's on persistent storage, at least you're going to look after your data source that you can build your business cases on for shared infrastructure and stuff like that. Um, yeah, don't 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 miss that one, folks. If you do use it for monitoring, or whatever, make sure you've got some some good persistent storage on that. You will definitely, or you should definitely, be planning to use the data that's on that. Anyway, sorry, Andy. Or in a way to, or a or a really good baked in way to recover to hmm. um, a consistent point in time. You yep. know. Uh, to where you can be back up and running monitoring, uh, back up and running with that monitoring, right? Yep. Yeah, I think it's, you know, um, we look at, you know, we, when we deploy something VMware as a virtual machine, we've got a backup team, we've got a storage team, we've got a blah, blah, blah team that manages all those little components, right? And when we put it all into Kubernetes um, and it's stateless, we've got processes around that. But as we, you know, dehydrate VMware and and hydrate workloads into here, those same practices become requirements, right? Especially if you're publicly traded or you're, or you're government, so military um, or service provider or somebody who's subject to some kind of compliance where you have to have, you know, reasonable amounts of time for recovery and things like that. Um, you suddenly have to look at those those factors. So again, I'll go back to my, it's not an if, it's when. So I'm going to stop beating that dead horse and move on. <laughs> um, perfect segue though. Um, you know, I was going to say, talk about on plan, vice versa, but let's just go into the next slide. Um, you know, I was going to talk about some of the solutions that uh, Portworks offers in this space and kicks backups, probably a good segue into it. Um, so, one of the one of the tools that Portworx offers is a tool called PX Backup, and it allows you know easy backup and recovery across Kubernetes applications, um, including application configurations, so things like config maps and secrets, um, and as as well as persistent data. And it allows you to move data across clusters, so they can be on prem or in the cloud, or they can be cloud to cloud. So you can back up an entire namespace and all the constructs that make up that namespace and restore them like for like. 
And you can be very granular with it in that, let's say I have a database, like a Mongo database, and I want to, you know, flush all the writes to disk, and I want to, um, you know, do all this before I take a snapshot. Those are app native things that you can do with our backup tool. So you don't need to do it outside of it. You don't need to kick off a script or anything like that. Those are things that can be done in the tool because it's, it's application aware. It's built to be aware of Kubernetes state. Um, and it's a UI base. So you can either you know schedule API calls or you can do it, use a, a UI. And it's granular in that um, it accepts token authentication, so you can be granular with, you know, I'm Joe developer, I have this namespace, I have only these volumes, and you only have access to back them up, and you only have access to restore them. And I'm Andy, the network administrator, or the administrator, and I have access to all of them, I can back up all of them, and I can restore them forever. Very granular in that, um, in that regard. Um, and that's PX backup. Andy, just a thought. The backup's drivable via command line and via the GUI. Correct. Just thought I'd clarify. Didn't I say that? I thought I did. Um, and. The next one's PXDR. So this is synchronous replication. Um, this is probably arguably what I have the most conversation with customers um, all over APJ. Um, so PXDR for you infrastructure focused people is very similar to the way storage vendors do synchronous replication between two storage arrays. Um, so we're taking a Portworx cluster and we're stretching it across two Kubernetes clusters. Now they're gonna be um, in a similar geo, so Sydney data center east and west, or Amazon um, um, AWS um, availability zone one and two, or A and B. Um, and you know, requiring like a minimum, uh, a maximum latency, I think of 11 milliseconds. Um, so what we're doing is an application, as writes come in, we're synchronizing those writes across the clusters. Um, so we're using um, RPC calls over TCP to replicate that volume and it's zero RPO. So when a write comes in, we replicate it across, we wait for the acknowledgement, uh, or we wait for the write to come back and acknowledge before we send an acknowledgement up to the application. So with that, we can offer um, zero RPO um, on a data set. So that Prometheus cluster that was running in you know, data center one, if his building catches fire and burns to the ground or that data center loses power or somebody unplugs a rack, uh, cable in a rack inadvertently and it takes that that node offline or that cluster offline, um, we can move that application and its date, the, the state the data was in um, at that, the last time that a data write was, was performed. So no data loss. So we just do a failover and we bring it up. Now let's say we, restore that site, maybe we replug power, we put out the fire, it was just the coffee machine and the site's now back online, we can also fail that back and we can do it automatically. So, you know, your load balancer or your, um, you know, you can have a health check on, on your DNS record to just point that back over automatically. Um, and this is application aware. So, it's backing up, you know, the secret, the config map, the persistent volume, the volume claim, everything that makes up that um, application in the namespace gets back that gets backed up. Now we do zero RPO with the data, and we can configure um, interval schedules of you know zero to whatever we want for the state of the application. So things that don't change, right? Like we don't change a secret all the time. We probably don't change the config all the time. Um, you know, we may not do lots of updates to the app all the time. So those are things that we can throttle how often we synchronize that that data. So very granular in that. And this this um, this image has some common ones that people use it for, um, that we've seen customers use. But it's not limited to these these um, applications. We, it's anything that you would deploy in Kubernetes with a state um, 
it's a stateful application. You could even use it for state uh, non-stateful as well. Um, and then the next one is asynchronous. Um, similar to synchronous replication, but this is more um, across geos. So I have a site in Singapore and one in Hong Kong, or I have a site in Sydney and one in London. Um, so we bridge that um, distance gap with asynchronous replication. So we're sending snapshots, same thing over RPC calls via TCP um, from one cluster to the, to the next. So we can actually have a warm site that we can bring online as well. Now, I just want to summarize. So, you know, we started out appliance-based CSI, that open source driver, which enables automated storage provisioning inside Kubernetes. And this allows stateful applications the capability to leverage IT infrastructure for use inside Kubernetes. And we find a myriad of use cases like virtualization, database, data science, workloads like Jupyter as a service, uh, where performance or large data sets may be a factor. And this capability to run workloads on a storage platform, it makes it a general, uh, a good general use candidate. Now, then we looked at software-defined storage landscape. Now, the space is full of vendors, some simple bolt-ons to existing tech, while others offer feature-rich application-aware solutions. And a popular space among developers who are looking for more application-aware solutions that are production-ready. Now, and lastly, we looked at some of the concerns of running cloud storage, along with the caveats and pitfalls. And these are some of the concerns that we see that drive people away from stateful workloads. And then we looked at you know, the ways that Portworx can natively address these concerns and fill in gaps of stateful workloads in Kubernetes. With things like synchronous and asynchronous DR, which allow Kubernetes-like capability of moving workloads. And then on the PX backup, offering application-aware backup and restore capability of any Kubernetes cluster. But guys, this is a fast-moving space. You know, I'll bet as soon as the discussion ends, there'll be a revision of something that changes somewhere. And as more people standardize their deployments on Kubernetes, I think we're only going to uh, grow and become more complex. So I'm kind of thinking that you know, simple, op simple to operate platforms with single data management planes could provide those solutions. And that's all. Thanks for watching. That was a very quick, uh, quick ending there, Andy. I know. Uh, I've got a couple of questions, Andy, if that's all right. I'm not sure, just whilst uh, everybody has a little think, if you've got any last questions for um, Andy or the gang, just pop, pop them up in the chat or questions. And um, yeah, I've just got a couple of questions for you, if that's all right. So you guys, I mean, poor, poor, um, if you, or contribute a lot to um, open source. So, you know, the CSI drivers that you mentioned tonight, are they like are those all part of the open source sort of deal or yeah, CSI spec is in it is through the Kubernetes, it's a through the community, open source community. So um you know originally in the earlier release of Kubernetes there was um a flex driver for storage and that was part of the tree of kubernetes so every time a new kube version came out you get a hopefully an updated version of storage yep. um it, it was moved out of the um tree to its own separate tree so that we can manage updates to that storage driver similar to way the 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 network interface driver so um you know we can release updates to um, that driver to add features. So like 1.3 is the most recent. Um, and you know features releases that are being worked on, actually I think 1.3 now has resize without rescan, um, at least with, the, with Pure's CSI driver. So you can resize the volume and not have to restart the pod, stuff like that. Um, but you know features like, like we're working on with our CSI for our array, things like integrating um, our active cluster um, capability into that CSI. Um, and then every vendor, you know, CSI is an open source spec, right? So you write your API to send management and storage calls to Kubernetes um, using a standardized 
common framework. So everyone has a, has the same framework. And every vendor will have variances um, into how they do it. Some vendors will say, I have a CSI for this array, one for this array, one for this array, and a different configuration for each one of them. Um, some of them will embed all of them so you can you know, aggregate all of those arrays in one platform. Um, and then you'll find um, the more mature companies will be more in sync with the latest feature releases um, where companies that probably don't drive as much business to you know, this space may not put as much resources into it. We've got a team dedicated to, um, uh, just dedicated to CSI. So we've also got a team for OpenStack as well. Okay. That just, just focuses on that. What about, you know, what about, I mean, you know, the old sort of sysadmin in me is coming out here. I'm thinking about what, what tooling you guys either may recommend or provide to be able to gain visibility of the, you know, the main offenders that are chew chewing up this, uh, you know, this persistent storage that we just configured. Well, you know, our, how do you alert on it? How do you monitor on it? Or is it all sort of Kubernetes command line stuff? Because that's fairly horrible. Well, um, you know, we treat we treat volume um, we treat CSI volumes or volumes version by CSI just as normal volumes on the array. So you have the normal management array um, capability. Um, we've also built a tool called PSO Explorer where we can, that's a UI that basically you deploy it in Kubernetes and then you can have a nice dashboard where you can log into it and look at, you know, the volumes uh, provisioned from CSI. So what, what are the namespaces? What are the persistent volumes? What are the pods? How big are those volumes? Are they growing? Are they shrinking? Um, and pretty good like visual mapping of, of that volume data. And then, you know, one of the things that we're adding, we'll be adding to that is, so Pure has a feature called Pure One, which is an analytics tool we use to do log ingest from all our arrays, where we can capture metrics and do like, um, you know, look at load, look at, um, at bugs and stuff like that. We feed that metadata into the cloud from every array. We're also feeding that, looking to feed that metadata from or explore in Kubernetes into it. So you have a cloud view of all of your platforms. So like if you had a fleet of arrays, you'd be able to look at all of your pods, all of your persistent volumes, all your volume claims, like from your iPhone. Pretty comprehensive. <laughs> I, it's a, I mean, we, it's a space that we see growing exponentially over the next three to five years. So we're pretty heavily invested in that space. I mean, we, we acquired Portworks in September of last year. Um, Portworx is, was regarded as probably the, you know, number one storage platform in Kubernetes. Um, it has the most feature rich platforms that are the most mature. They've been GA since like 2014. Um, so a lot of, and we've got, you know, pretty big, big customers in the U S um, running production, uh, a lot of government, um, fortune 500, stuff like that, um, at, you know, really large scales. So I've done a lot of testing and a lot of, a lot of customer use cases. So. Yeah, I see. I, I personally had, had not heard of uh, Portworks until for, fairly recently. But I'm thinking yep. they, they too have also got some massive customers. So there's they got have. some, you know, some compelling offering. They must solve some really good business, quite quality business problems for them to, you know, to be competing in that space. Well, there was no, um, there was no one in the space in NZ until now. So that's a large part why uh, I'm, I'm not, you know, being US companies tend to be very US focused. I'm sure anybody in the room that's worked with a US vendor or US company, they tend to look at um, the global or the fortune 500 is sort of their, their view, right? I think a lot of people look at that perspective. So, um, but I think we look at NZ as a mini Silicon Valley. I mean, we've got the brightest, we've got the smartest people here. Um, and you know we are early adopters. I think um, Australia, and New Zealand are on on the same plane as what I would see in Silicon Valley. I mean, we're doing the same stuff that people are doing over there. So cool. At least from my perspective. Your humble but correct perspective, as it were. <laughs> Mostly. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, any um, any last questions for 
<laughs> for Andy before I nail him with another one. <laughs> oh, nail him away. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Let's not be shy. Any last questions? I think uh, we've done good. I've I most certainly learned some stuff uh, today. Th thank you very much, um, Andy, Lana, and Paul um, for taking time out of your busy schedules to come in and help make me hopefully sound a little bit smarter when it comes to um, school stuff. <laughs> On this uh, K K8S stuff that people keep talking about. <laughs> no worries. <laughs>